Hello, listeners. We recorded last week's mini-sode and this episode in one sit-down, without really pausing in between. We didn't decide until after the fact that we were going to do two different episodes. So this one kind of picks up in the middle of a conversation, but the transition into the actual conversation happens fairly fluidly. So forgive the unusual opener, and I hope you enjoy the episode. Is the reason I came here after all. Here, slap me in the face and I wake up. Oh, nope. No. no one ever takes me up on that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it seems too mean. Also, if I were to accidentally hurt you, then I would feel extremely bad. You already told us that you have a terrible headache. Yeah, but you know, like. Slapping you is not what we want to do. Did you ever have a sibling now? where it's like, oh man, I stubbed my foot, it hurts, and they hit you on the arm? Hey, does your foot still hurt? No. So, Thank goodness I've never had that. God, that sounds terrible. Siblings yeah. my friends. I didn't have a great support group growing up. <laughs> um, so. No, but I mean, because I, I don't have a lot of practice slapping people, I might accidentally, like, hit you in the ear and burst your eardrum oh, or yeah, something. And, I appreciate that. I don't want to take that risk. So there's a difference that, uh, like, Aristotle talks about with. Like voluntary versus non-voluntary and involuntary. Is this being recorded? No, mm-hmm. because Aristotle is a guy. He yeah. is. Okay. This will come up, so we can let's dive right no, in. No, no, no. He's voluntary versus involuntary harms. Well, I'm and saying we dive into this. This can come up on that too. But so, like, if I said hit me mm-hmm. and you hit me and I slipped off the chair and fell into this, mm-hmm. well, that's kind of on me because I asked for it. But like, if I out of nowhere pushed you and you broke the chair and broke that door, mm-hmm. that's on me. Even though like you broke it with with your body, right? Well, yeah. So that's that's a distinction that he draws with between like. Voluntary, involuntary, non-voluntary. Non-voluntary would be, like... Or non-voluntary would be pushing into the door. Involuntary would be, like, succumbing to acrasia, where, you know, you do one thing even knowing that something else is good for you. What's this acrasia thing? Acrasia is, uh... When you act against your own self-interest knowingly because of a failure of will. Okay. So, you know, if you're, you break a diet or you cheat on your spouse uh, or something, right? I see. So... You know, like, well, I've been counting my calories, but God, chocolate donut, you know? I understand. I bought donuts for the house for the first time in, like, months on (gasps) this weekend. No, why did you do that? (laughs) I felt like it. Probably (laughs) a great show, whatever. I I don't really have a a policy against against eating unhealthy things, so. I have this weird metabolism where I can eat whatever I want and never gain any weight, so. I've been the same weight for, like, ten years. Nice. Yeah. That, so that last. that's it. That's your that's our introduction into moral philosophy. So Aristotle is one of the the first known moral philosophers. He's he's big in the field. I'm not sure when we started recording. So this hopefully is, it was a good time. Is he? That's what the introduction to the book that Stephen lent me today said. Okay. Or was it Socrates? It was Socrates. Socrates yes, was, but Socrates too. might not exist. Well, Plato did. It was Socrates, so. as in Plato's writings. Yes. Well, like, so, the interesting thing, so I guess let's start, it was a warm sunny day in ancient Greece, no. Um, <laughs> my, my, my only real um, beef with that is that people have been doing moral theory forever, but uh, I guess... Of course. Were they really moral philosophers? Yeah. So, so what are, could you, could you list off the eight moral philosophies? I can only think of six or seven, but I'll try. You, um, you find out whichever one I miss. I... <laughs> so, uh, I will say real quick, though, that, that there is some disagreement. Uh, it's hard to get, like, a straight answer out of any philosopher in general. Um, Aristotle might not have been a moral philosopher in the way that we would use the term now, because morality had a different connotation 2,000 years ago in Greece than mm-hmm. it does today. So, like, his big book on ethics is less about, like, how to act right and do stuff like, you know, if you buy one of Peter Singer's books, it's more about how to live a good life. And that doesn't necessarily entail what we would call morality. So, Isn't, was he a moral philosopher? Who knows? What did you say? Okay, so yeah. the so one of them would be Aristotelian. Yeah. So, virtu- which is how to live a good life. Yeah, virtue ethics was Aristotle's okay. uh, framework. Um, in his book, the Nicomachean Ethics. So we've got virtue ethics as one of them. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got consequentialism, deontology, ego. I thought that con- consequentialism that there were multiple ones that fell under consequentialist as of like the 1960s there are they're basically interchangeable among philosophers up through then and today they basically still are consequentialism is essentially I, utilitarianism i would not say interchangeable i would say they all fall into under a same a similar school so but there can be vast differences between different types of consequentialism now there can be and i'm sure somebody will disagree with me if you're a philosopher out there you're going to find something wrong with what i'm going to say mm-hmm. but yeah so utilitarianism is the most popular version of of ethical consequentialism yes 
Okay, so I'm going to be probably the most ignorant person in the room on this, but in the very short amount of research that I did, I thought that there were multiple consequentialist um, moral theories, including utilitarianism and maybe egoism. Um, yeah, so, like, but you, an egoist wouldn't necessarily say they're a consequentialist. So, like, that's why I said, like, people use the terms interchangeably. Okay. So consequentialism is just saying, I'm going to act in a way that will maximize my desired outcome. And that can be... Uh, you know, investment of your money into uh, different accounts or whatever. So, like, it doesn't have to be about, you know, what utilitarianism is about. Uh, in Con Consequentialism the... analyzes the consequences. Right. And utilitarianism analyzes the consequences in as far as they maximize the well-being of... Uh, the subjects. Of the subjects, or of everyone involved. Um, depending okay. on consequential Or depending on the uh, utilitarian. In... Moral philosophy, I think that they, they tend to conflate, but yeah, there is a difference. Like, consequentialism is a broader thing, but if you say a consequentialist as far as your ethics, I think, I, I guess I might be wrong, but I think for the most part you're saying you're utilitarian of some flavor or another. Um, what uh, What's egoism? Egoism is... So we is... know virtue ethics. Right. We've talked about utilitarianism very briefly. We'll get back to all of these. Um, what's egoism? Egoism is doing... It's basically what kind of what it sounds like. It's, uh, my ethical system is what's best for me, and fuck you. Oh. Uh, there, there are better versions of it, but basically it's, I'm going to act in my own self-interest. Uh, is that like Ayn Randism? Is yes. that like objectivism? E yes, no. I, it depends. Okay. Uh, but like, broadly speaking, egoism is saying, I care about what's good for me, and, you know, if what's good for you happens to be good for me, then that's good. But, you know, if I... An egoist you know. would also argue that this is, in general, the best way to run the world. That outcomes are maximized for everyone if everyone is an egoist. An egoist? I guess that might be the case. My, my understanding would be that an egoist wouldn't really care about maximizing what's great for the world. They care about what's good for them. Right. But, but a good world is good for you, too. Yeah, and, so, and like Ayn Rand was a very strong believer that if everyone was selfish like this, the world would be a much better place. That a lot of the terrible things that happen are because people are trying to... Uh, make decisions for other people that are in their best interest, even though they aren't. Well, maybe that's why she created objectivism. Yes. As something separate from egoism. And maybe that's the one that's missing from my short little list here. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if she'd be an egoist or not. She might be an, ob an objectivist. Uh, so what is objectivism? Th th that's literally it's what that. she invented. Yeah. It's, it's that um, everything's... The world is better if everybody asks in their own self-interest. Acts in their own self-interest. Fair enough. I think egoism is more personal than that. So I think that that would be the distinction that I would draw. But I, again, if you're a philosopher, you're gonna you're gonna hate this. So write in with any brief corrections. Um, the the other couple to keep in mind are care ethics, which is sort sort of like uh, it's like egoism, but a little broader. I care about me and the people that I care about, hence the name. Um, you know, like my family, friends, and maybe my neighbors and you know my quote tribe. But like, I don't care about people in the third world or something. Hmm. Another ethical framework, if you can call it that, is uh, religious motivation for ethics. I do what I believe, or I, I'm what what is right is what's in the Bible, or what God said, or what my church teaches me. I've heard that called, I think, command theory. Divine command theory. Yeah, is what what's right is what God said in the Bible, right? Um, or what the gods want. In it doesn't necessarily have to be divine command every time, though. Sometimes it can be command of the king. Sure. That but, he happens to know exactly what's right. But then you're then, then it's not a religious motivation. Right. Yeah. So if it's a religious motivation, I don't know where the where to, when and where divine command theory came in, but in Plato's dialogue, the Euthyphro, Socrates is talking to this guy, and long story short, he's asking the guy, or the guy says to him, uh, the guy's name is Euthyphro. Euth Euthyphro. Euthyphro. Thank you. That's a dumb <laughs> twister. He said, no, no, uh, what's pious is what the gods say is pious and you, th you or socrates says well wait is it pious and we can change out some of these words we can change out gods for god and we can change out pious for good um is it good because god says it is well because socrates points out that god the gods may disagree and so euthyphro says well it's what they're unanimous on but since no one's a, since not many people now are polytheists uh we can change gods for god so is something good because god says it's good or is does god say it's good because it's good right so if, if it's good because God says it's good, he could change his mind tomorrow and murder become, you know, a, a moral ideal, right? 
or beating children to death or something, you know what? So if it's good just because God says it, then it makes morality just the whims of a possible bully, right? And if it's the other way around, well, then there's some underlying thing that God is saying is good because it's good out there and it would be good without God saying it too, as well. So, uh, so there are things that are in theory good, whether or not a God identifies them as good. Yeah. Uh, or, or they're just his whims, right? His or her whims. Um, I other... believe the, the way that the conversation went was uh, Socrates asked, asked Euthyphro, Euthyphro what is good, and Euthyphro said good is what the gods love. And Socrates asked him, do the gods love it because it is good, or is it good because the gods love it? Mm. Right. Yeah, and that, that's, that's the crux of the problem. And either way, Euthyphro's wrong, right? <laughs> so, or at least Euthyphro doesn't know what he's talking about, <laughs> which, is, which is kind of how every Socrates encounter ends. Yes. Um, yep. <laughs> the, the other main problem with like a religious motivation, so say you're just going to say, well, I draw my, my morality from the Bible, but I don't like this part, this part, or this part, but I like these two parts. So, you know, a contemporary example might be like, well, I'm not going to beat my slaves. I'm not going to keep slaves. I'm not going to, you know, stone my wife to death for, for cheating on me or something, but I don't like gay people. I'm going to stick with that one. So like, that's a contemporary example that some people in the United States would subscribe to. But that to me suggests that they have a separate criteria by which they're picking the rightness and wrongness things out of the Bible. And they're coming to the Bible with those things. Yeah. Um, I, I would, I would uh, phrase it as, and I think it's been phrased this way by other people that any divine command theory really boils down to who interprets who interprets the command. Yeah, or it could even be super straightforward, but you can look at it and say, well, it's, just, it's pretty clear I'm supposed to, you know, kill somebody for moving sticks on a Sunday, right. but I'm not going to do that, because right. I, feel, I feel like that's antiquated. Do you, do you listen to your priest's interpretation, right. or do you interpret it by yourself? Or... or you listen to God's interpretation that's written down in the Bible. Well, that's the problem. <laughs> it, the, the Bible doesn't tell you anything directly. You have to read it and interpret it yourself, or take the interpretation of someone who is more skilled in the Bible reading skills. As the expert ex-religionist, I'm going to go ahead and let you have that one. <laughs> so, it seems like we've determined that that one, we don't think it's correct. Yeah, well, I think it's... We don't, I but... think I think it's the easiest to dismiss. It's one of the, it's one of the easier ones to dismiss, and you, and you guys jumped on it to it, dismiss it. it. Well, it totally depends on how you feel about God. If you think that God does exist, then it's not quite so easy to dismiss. I'm going to make a case, after we go through all of them, that they're all basically consequentialist at the bottom. Mm. And... I'll give you a teaser. Sounds I think exactly what like, that sounds like exactly what a consequentialist would say. It does. No, but so you're part of like why you might say it's good for your kids to follow the teachings of the Bible or the teachings of your priest or whatever is because it's good for them to go to heaven afterwards. Mm -hmm. Well, it's got a good consequence. That's what you're pushing for at the end of it, right? Mm -hmm. It it might be good in and of itself. Or the consequence is God loves it, and that's a good enough consequence. Yeah, so that might be part of it too. Um, and that might not even have a consequence. Like if you don't believe in heaven, it might still be good. But uh, I think that, that a large part of it is wanting to go to heaven and avoid hell. There are a couple others. Yes. I missed it. The only other one I have is relativism. I want to do that one last. Deontology. So what... Oh, yeah. I, I, skimmed, I skimmed by that really quickly. Oh, uh, I mentioned the name of it, but I mentioned what it was. Yeah. So deontology is it's, it's strict rule-based. Uh, the most popular deontologist philosopher was Immanuel Kant. And I guess the first main popular one that goes back ages and there's contemporary ones now. The, the main thing is Kant's formulation was called the categorical imperative, where the moral action is, or is to act only in that, oh, what is it, act only in a way by which you can, uh, at the same time, will that action become a universal law. And that's Kant's needlessly convoluted way of saying that only do stuff that you could, at the same time, will everyone else do all the time without being inconsistent. Uh, so that rules out things like stealing and lying, Otherwise, you're, you know, so if you break a promise and you lie, you're saying, well, I want everyone else to break their promises to me, and I want them to break their promises, promises to each other, and then promises don't make any sense anymore. Or, it's okay for me to steal, but no one else. Well, if you want to universalize stealing, he makes this kind of case where, you know, if you're stealing from them, they can steal from their neighbors, they can steal from you, and you're basically saying it's okay to steal from your own pocket. So the, treat others as you would like to be treated. Yeah. Kind of, but it's it's not even how much like you would like to be treated, but in the way that everyone could always treat each other all the time. So like you might want someone to lie, you might lie to your partner and say yes, you look great, or you know whatever in that dress or something, because you think it's okay to tell white lies. But there are no fuzzy boundaries for Kant. So so the goal of the ontologist is to find the best rules, the ones that are most reflective of what actually is moral, and then follow them. Yes, there's also a difference by what he means by moral. So, like, the consequentialist would say it's good by what actually happens. 
the gentologist says the that moral moral action is motivated from a sense of duty and the action itself is good um it doesn't really matter what happens mm -hmm. Uh, all that matters is that you did the right thing, which... The goodness is evaluated by how closely it conforms to the rule, rather than by what the consequences are. Yes. So, that does put you in a situation where you could kill a million people and still have done the right thing, but that's... I'm, I'm obviously not a deontologist, so... <laughs> well, no, that's, that's the fun part of consequentialism. It's one of those things that does let you kill a million people and it'd be the right thing. Well, only if the alternative would have been killing a million and one people, right? right? Whereas the deontologist... Uh, you know, it could be... Killing is bad, if you're a deontologist, right? Yes. Yes, but not... So killing somebody yourself is, but even Kant gives this this long explanation of... And I forget the name, the long name of the essay. I sent it to you earlier. Um, I'll put it on the, the listing for the website. But it was... He does articulate that in the extreme case where you're hiding somebody, you came to your door and said, someone's going to kill me, you know, I'm looking for sanctuary. You said, yeah, come hide in my basement. And then that killer shows up at your house with an axe, and they said, hey, is that person here? I want to kill him. Kant would say, don't lie to that person. And if that sounds like a straw man, that's, uh, he, that's his fault. Um, <laughs> he, he says, well, you know, you could say, no, they're not here, and then the axe murderer could wander away, only to see that the person fled your basement and is now running down the street. But that seems to be like he's arguing from adverse consequences, consequences which makes him sound like a consequentialist. Uh, and presumably if you had said, yeah, he's right inside, uh, you would either have to kill the person to stop them, fight them to stop them, or let them kill you, and then, or let them pass and go kill that person. I think in theory, as, uh, as a person who is a deontologist, uh, the person coming to you run, uh, asking for shelter would understand that you would not lie for, to, to hide the, conceal the presence yeah. if they know that you're a deontologist. Which is kind of a bummer, though, right? Like, so that means, like, no hiding Jews in your attic. Well, uh, it it it, <laughs> it does mean that yes, <laughs> and I mean so there there's there's no recipe by which to flex the rules at all, even in an extreme case like you know Nazis at the door. Is this mm. kind of like voting systems where every every moral philosophy, every moral theory has major problems no, in certain circumstances? There's one obviously right one. <laughs> <laughs> no bias or anything though. No bias. Hey, again, I read the intro. I didn't get much. Time to read the book that you lent me, but the intro said that there are no right answers. The intro is trying to be nice, and that's like that's like the, that's, that's the philosophy one hundred and one answer to like everything. And so that, that's well, kind of like it called... didn't say that there are no wrong answers either. Ooh. So, like, part of the reason philosophy isn't loved in the rationalist community partly because it's bad. <laughs> that's at, an understatement. At, at pushing out bad ideas. Um, if you can make a case for it, then hey, you can write your book, and we'll all read it. Um, it doesn't matter how stupid your, your belief is, we're gonna, we'll take it, we'll entertain it as seriously as is appropriate for the field of philosophy, which is seriously indeed. Often the more, more stupid ideas are more popular just because they're more entertaining. Yeah, there's that too. Um, well, not often, but sometimes. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to cover philosophical zombieism at some point. Mm. Yeah, we had a little conversation about that today when I was saying, you know, most of the philosophers that I meet don't even know what that is, but yet... We and Less Wrong talk about how philosophers are really into it all the time. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because it's the one thing that the primary sequences on Less Wrong actually talk about as a philosophical uh, topic in a way that's super clear. Um, so I think that's the easiest hobby horse for people to jump on. But it is popular, like I said, in philosophy of mind. Uh, David Chalmers writes books on it. Uh, Dan Dennett writes books against it. And these people are all, these are all people that are alive today. They didn't all die 500 years ago. Like you would think an idea this bad would have. Um, <laughs> so the, the last approach to ethics, and then we're going to go back and do a little digging into each of them is moral, moral relativism. Mm -hmm. Uh, everyone has met a moral relativist. Most likely it, they're the people who would say that there's no such thing as right and wrong you know, your belief is just as valid as their belief, and there's no criteria by which to judge which one's more right or more wrong. That sounds an awful lot like the church I grew up in. Yeah, it's a great wishy-washy nice way to approach things, but it, it doesn't really hash out. The, the moral relativist will also go on to say it's wrong to be intolerant of other people's beliefs, and they trip themselves before they even finish tying their boots. Actually, uh, we had, again, uh, referring to church, we had a lot of discussions about that about how we needed to be more tolerant of people who are intolerant because that was also okay. 
Yeah, I my first IRL encounter with a Marvel relativist was in college. It was one of my professors, and she used the example of female genital mutilation, saying, "There's nothing that we can say is wrong with that." And I'm like, "You're a woman. You're the last person. You're, you're like the second to last people that I think that would be." saying that this is a defensible position. I uh, People like that I always think of as straw men, but apparently they, they actually exist. Some of them actually exist. Walking I, straw men. I think the impulse is like... What did she think about rape? What did she think about uh, I'm sure she was on child board. rape? I'm sure, she, I'm sure... So, like, the... It's not saying that... Uh, the more, And I don't want to straw men them too much. The straw men moral relativist would say, well, there's nothing wrong with it. They would say, it's wrong for our society. But if there's another society that enshrines it, well, we can't judge our their society by the basis of ours. Who's to say ours is better? See, like I, we are, but that's not fair. So I, I prefer the the type of moral relativist, more of an emotive uh, emotive uh, per, uh, philosophy that says there is no actual grounding in any sort of like objective wrong ons and right ons out there. But we still make our own decisions as to what's right or wrong, and we can impose those on others. But can you can you um, imagine a culture in which it is okay? Yeah, um, there were yeah. cultures where it was okay to rape children. Oh, there yeah. are cultures where it's okay to rape children, right? And, uh, so, like, and I mean, um, I'm going to have to find the article, and I, I apologize ahead of time if I can't. But um, I I saw somewhere that in places where it's culturally okay to do that the long-term impact on the victim is less severe, significantly less severe than in cultures where it is not okay to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so that, there are, if we were to, I'm trying not to pick real-world examples, but it's, it's hard not to. So, like, you know, I guess we could use, you know, child rape as an example. So, yeah, that could be the case, where if it's if it's normal, and hopefully your uh, your abuser isn't super savage about it, then, yeah, you might not be that worse off after the fact but uh you know the second you move to somewhere that doesn't do that and you try and do that thing you're gonna scar somebody um so i think it's not so much moral relativism isn't so much about saying that you know you can't make a judgment it's saying that one culture can't judge another so like me i think it again depends on the moral relativist yeah i'm trying trying to think think most of the ones nowadays are that way which yeah, is really to... sad, but there's there's others that don't Absolutely. go that far. There are some that are also, you know, just like full on, no, so, no, nothing's right or wrong. I'm trying to be as charitable as possible. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but like, so it would be nonsensical and wrong of me, or at least incorrect of me to say, women in the United States are treated on average better than women who live under the Taliban. They would say, well, you're just judging that based off your culture. You know, why would you say... You know, they, they would say that they treat theirs better than you treat yours, or that they treat theirs appropriately or something. They, the moral activist would say, you have no place to stand if I challenge you that, and you say, no, I'm right, they're wrong. Uh, that that kind of comes down to the bottom of... The way to defeat any physical, philosophical argument is to attack their very first premise. So the premise that, like, well-being is good is the premise that you take if you're going to develop any ethical system. And if you're going to deny that, and like, well, what is well-being? What is good? Like, uh, you can't get off the ground, and that's how you just stop anything in its tracks. Yeah. I have a question about that. Sorry, so, I'm talking a lot. No, uh, I want you to talk a lot since you're very passionate about this subject. Mm-hmm. Um, so my question is, I'm pretty sure that I've been using moral relativism incorrectly forever, um, up until now maybe, because I'm about to ask for some clarification. So, I mean... Early on in Less Wrong, when we met each other, I said, I'm absolutely a moral relativist. And what I meant by that is that um, between species, and we're talking about, you know, like the the three worlds collide type situation, or, you know, between different species of mammals or animals in general, or um, that there is some, there's some relativity in terms of what is good for them and what is bad for them. Right. So there, you know, it might be good to die for your offspring's survival, but, you know, in our culture, we tend to think it's not good to die for your offspring, you know, to die every, <laughs> Wait, <I think laughs> maybe, maybe that's not, a, that. maybe yeah. that's not a good example. Um, maybe to eat your, your competitor's offspring so that your family has a better chance at living. That's yes. probably a better example. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sure. We, we wouldn't be in favor of eating our neighbor's kids. So in some cultures, that uh, are primarily not human, I'd say, uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Eat your, eat your competitor's children. 
so that your your genetic offspring have a better chance of surviving and that's not a thing that we condone in fact we'd say it's really a terrible awful bad thing um, to do here so I thought that that was moral relativism in that literally there's no good or bad aside from what we assign to it what we as humans assign to it and we can only assign it to humans yeah i think um a moral relativist would say they wouldn't say we as humans they'd say we as americans or we as whatever this in-group is and that we can't judge that out group but honestly um, if i i can't judge the ancient romans for the pedophilia either or the pederasty you i think it would be safe to say that we've made progress from I, the way that they used to do things i can and i do i'm okay judging people yeah, so like we're better than our than you know slave slave owners because we don't. I think it's good that we don't own slaves, and so you know it doesn't mean that they were all monsters. It was normal for the time or something, right? I'm curious um, where you draw the line of humans. Yeah, I wanted to mention really quick too that I think that like why not are you not okay with judging lions that kill the the you know the offspring of, of their competitors? Because that's what they do. Yeah, but that's it's still their evil. Thing. No, it's good for them. Uh, there's a lot of things that are good for an individual they, that are still evil. They can. It's not evil. It's how is it evil for a lion to kill its competitor's offspring? Uh, because they are murdering someone. It's it's not murder. Okay, it's not it's murder. Not... They are killing a thing that does not want to die. Yes, they have to do that all the time in order to survive. I also think that's a bad thing. I. <laughs> I, I think I can put some of this to rest as long as we're using the words like moral and ethics that. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the big names in moral philosophy, Mill, Kant, Aristotle, I think all the books talk about ethics with reasoning agents. Mm -hmm. um, it, it would be so like ludicrous, no, nothing... I'm sorry, no, no, it's but... ludicrous to apply that to non-humans. Right. Well, so, they... but, but even to assume that they, that anything is good for them in the same way that something is good for us, we're using two different uses of the word good there. So like, we'll, we might mean something that is good for them is great for their like reproductive fitness or something. But when we talk about good for ourselves, we mean, like, morally right. You know what I mean? We don't just mean, like, good for our reproductive fitness. Right. But, um, you know, there are social animals that also have moral codes. There are things that can be done, and there are things that will be punished, mm -hmm. right, by the other animals in their community um, if they're done. For example, uh, there is a viral penguin video. Um, adultery in penguins. Oh, I didn't see this one. Oh, there was a, there was a terrible fight um, penguins are, uh, like, like many birds, they're serial monogamists. So they stick with one mate through the breeding season. Mm -hmm. Although there are, um, a certain incidents of extra pair copulations and which we're kind of just starting to understand the extent of through genetic testing and increased observations. <laughs> but there are things like, uh, there are songbirds that, if they... Well, you never told us what happened to the penguin. Oh, um, I actually didn't watch the whole thing because I didn't want... I saw that the penguins were fighting and there was lots of blood involved. Oh, shit. And they I got pissed. didn't want to... Uh, I didn't want to watch a bloody penguin battle. Yeah. But that's what happened. It was a bloody penguin battle. So a penguin got caught cheating on its penguin mate? Yes. Aw. <laughs> so... I think... So that's something that they consider bad in their penguin culture, mm -hmm. right? So there's... To the point that other people not involved came in to punish. Well, yeah, it was the two male penguins. Oh, okay. Yeah, so it was the original mate and then the extra pair oh, okay, okay. mate. So I think that there's, there's still a component missing with penguins of, like, the rational agent involved, where they're not doing it because... Look, you've you've transgressed our codes. This is the last time. It's more like that's my fertilized egg repository, not yours. I'm gonna fight you for it. Right. And like, I don't think it's even articulated on that level with a penguin. I might be wrong. There might be more to it in your life of, of a penguin than I think, but I don't think so. Well, how do you uh, think that they form connections? I think that in some ways it's probably a, similar to us. I I guess uh, if it is, there might be something going on in their heads that uh betrayal isn't obvious, but love you know yeah but i think i think it's kind of just like urges there i think the key the key component for for a moral agent is a rational actor okay so and we're so, we're defining it as morality only applies to humans specifically well to rational humans too not babies not mentally infirm humans like so it's wrong for me to hit inyash 
But if there was a toddler in here swinging around a toy bat or something and it hit him, it's not. You don't blame the toddler. It didn't. It, do, oh, it I doesn't. I blame the toddler. You blame the parent if you're if you're gonna if you want you know like you know what I mean though. It's not like the toddler isn't. It's just basically a a, a mindless robot running around swinging its arms. No, it's not. Like, it can learn. I, I mean, I would like for the parents to teach it these things, but if the parents aren't going to, then I would tell the toddler not to do that, and might I might give it negative reinforcement. For sure, you you would you would discipline it. You would reinforce the positive behavior. That's saying... what morality is. But yeah. you, you wouldn't you wouldn't assign blame to it in the way that you would assign blame to somebody like if an adult came in here. Yeah. What, you what if Dio mean? came in here mm-hmm. and bit you hard? I would give Dio some negative reinforcement as long as it would. I could still come back into the house. But you, you would, I would I would give Dio to you and urge you to give Dio negative reinforcement. <laughs> if Dio came in here and bit me, the facial expression that I gave him. <laughs> yes. If he came and bit me, I'd do whatever it took to get him off of me if it was actually hurting me. Well, yeah, uh, that would be stuff. And I love dogs. I wouldn't. I would hate to hurt it, but I would. I, I would get desperate at some point. Right. Um, you like your blood inside your body. Right? <laughs> yes. Uh, but yeah, so you would Guys, feel a uh, public service announcement. If you're bitten by a dog, hold still until the dog opens its mouth to get a better grip. And then remove. The dog's reaction to something being still mm-hmm. after its first grip is to get a better grip. Huh. If you pull away, it'll just keep on pulling and shaking. Okay. I, I did hear once that if uh, you manage to get a dog to bite onto like an article of clothing or like a rope that you're holding, to keep yanking at that and the dog will not try to go after you, he'll just keep clamping onto that thing. This can all be gleaned through careful observation of a game of tug of war with any dog. Right, but so you'd have also to... through personal experience with dog bites. Yes. Oh shit! So, do they open their mouth long enough for you to yank your arm away? Yes. It only takes oh. a second. You just okay. stay calm, stay still, and then the the first bite's never in the right position. Right. If if the thing's still and it's not trying to get away, that means they they have the instinct that they have the time to get a better grip. Huh. You can do this with a dog. Just play tug of war and like you know, <laughs> let it, let them grab it and then pull really quick and they'll they'll hold on to it. Yeah, yeah. And if you hold it still, you let it up, let them grab it, and then hold it for a second. They'll adjust their grip. See, I've never done that. No. And so, I just always assumed the adjustment would be so quick you couldn't pull away in time. I mean, I guess maybe hopefully the adrenaline would kick in. Anyway, so if uh, Dio bites you, don't hurt him. <laughs> But he's so small and easy to hurt. He is, which is why you shouldn't do it. Ah. So, another, uh, if, if if dogs and children aren't just done enough, uh, you wouldn't blame a car that the parking brake failed and backed into you. No. No. Because so like, a car can't learn. Well, yeah, I guess, but uh, I think that there, there is a component of, I think, there's, there's in the blame field versus, and to me, yeah. there's blame versus, like, reinforcing behavior. Like, yeah. Is I, there a difference? Yes. Yeah, one would say you're a bad person. The other one, the other one would say, "I wish you won't do that again." And you're a bad person. No. <laughs> no. I, oh, wow. You, you say, people are not as judgy as you me. You say you're a good person, but that behavior was bad. Mm. Don't maybe, do maybe it Maybe I again. shouldn't be a parent. D- depending on the moral philosopher that you are, you can't say somebody's a bad person. No. But uh, I think you. I think you can't say that about things that aren't thinking. Like they're just doing. Uh, I was thinking but, about how to treat a child. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. You don't want to tell a child it's a bad person. Kid, kid uh, runs up to you and kicks you. You don't say, like, you're a terrible child. You say you're a good you child who does stupid things. They say you're naughty. Don't do that. It's, it's incredibly harmful. It, does it stop the child from kicking? Y- y- so They're too busy drinking their short term, to kick The question is short-term versus long-term, mm-hmm. but we'll go into child-rearing techniques another time. Okay. So, uh, see, I don't, I, don't, I don't care all that much about... This, this blame or this reasoning, I care more as to whether I can change the behavior. Yeah, I think that... Which is what, what I... Which, to me, is what morality comes down to. Yeah, I think irrespective of, like, what you care about there, I think those are two different things, but... Also, what's uh, your goal? Mm-hmm. Right? My you goal can, is to not be kicked. Okay, but if Dio comes in here and bites you, you can make sure it doesn't happen again by killing him. Oh, no. Right? Mm-hmm. Or you can make sure it doesn't happen again by you know, going through a different technique, right? Like teaching him that's what naughty dogs do, and he's not a naughty dog. <laughs> that's right. He's better than that. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. So you have multiple goals, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Uh, maybe you want to raise a well-adjusted child, or right. you don't want to, like, ruin somebody. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm not going to kill the kid for hitting me with a bat. Right. Even though that would... <laughs> Even though that, that would stop goal. the bat hitting, <laughs> yes. Oh, <laughs> I have other long-term goals. <laughs> so, as far as, like, character stuff, that was something that, that uh, Kant and 
Aristotle focus on more than Mill and Bentham, the utilitarians. So the the virtue ethicist, virtue ethics is Aristotle's uh, hobby horse, and it's less about like doing the right thing, and it's more about being a good person. Um, I'm a big fan of virtue ethics. Yeah, mm-hmm. people people like it. Part of the reason people like it is that Aristotle was super down to earth, whereas Plato was like super mystic and and fuzzy wuzzy. Aristotle being down to earth was cognizant of the fact that reality is super vague and I can't give you a set of rules that you can follow all the time because the world will throw something at you that I can't predict. So, you know, here's the kind of way to approach life in general and that that's that will lead you to be a good person. Um, the the way... things I like about instilling good virtues in people is that you can't predict every single consequence of every single action, which is one of my main beefs with consequentialism as applied to actual real life. Sure. Uh, so what there you want... There are always unintended consequences. Yes, and, and we're not perfect predictors. We, we can't tell what all the consequences of something will be. But if you find a set of virtues that tend to have generally very positive outcomes, and you instill those in people, then not only will you usually get positive outcomes, but they will be self, um, self-motivated. What are these virtues? That's a good question. What is, what is a virtue? <laughs> if, I, if I say that maybe um, a virtue is being honest... Mm-hmm. That doesn't put me into the deontology camp of always tell the truth? No, because you're saying honesty is a virtue rather than uh, it is a categorical imperative that no one ever lie. Well, and, and you can turn honesty, you know, down to one or up to ten. So, you know, honesty might be like being super brash and uh, but the good abrasive thing... with people or, yeah. or being, you know, super wishy-washy, never committing to anything. Those would be kind of the two extremes around honest, the virtue of honesty, right? But the, the advantage, in my opinion, that uh, virtue has over deontology is that there is no intrinsic motivation to follow a deontological rule unless someone has already really drilled into you that deontology is great. And if you want to be a good person and valued by your society, you will follow these rules. But if you have the virtue of honesty... By the very fact of having that desire to be honest, you are already self-motivated to be honest. Yeah. The motivation comes with having that virtue. Kant made a very uncompelling argument that if you're a really rational person, you'll be motivated towards deontology. Yes. Uh, that it that that's the rational approach for any, or that's the that's the approach to to action that any rational agent would do. That's a very common um, um, common thing for people to claim. Ayn Rand cl- claimed the exact same thing. Yeah. The perfectly rational person would be a uh, follower of her morality, which is why it's objectivism, because it is the objectively rational uh, morality. Yeah, when you get to name your own stuff, you get to, you get to sound really <laughs> smart, right? right. Um, so let's think of another virtue. Does every, does every moral theory claim that? Um, no, probably not. I, I, Aside from moral relativism, apparently. I was about to say... Yeah, not relativism. I don't even call that a moral theory. That's like that's like not collecting stamps as a hobby, right? So, um, <laughs> well, relativism is more descriptive than it is prescriptive. Yeah, I thought that that was the same with the consequentialism. Uh, uh, no, no, consequentialism no. Is, actually, is absolutely prescriptive. Okay. Uh, they they they're going to say you should do these things and you should do whatever will maximize happiness. But okay. I want to fin- I want to finish on virtues. Yes. Let's think of one more, and then we can find the common theme. I'll leave it to you guys. Think of what is a virtuous thing. Uh, to do. To, or I guess a virtuous attribute. Uh, show to, up on time. Sure. I was going to say not harm people, but show up on time is good. So, I mean, like, not harm people would be... I mean, there's there's cases where you would harm people. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, not harming people can't be the right thing all the time, right? So maybe, mm-hmm. like... A, no, but if you have the virtue of, of disliking when you harm people, that'll prevent you from harming people unless something much greater outweighs it. Right. Or you can turn it to the other... You know, turn it down to one the other way, and you'll never hurt anybody no matter what. And that right. also seems like a stupid position, right? You can end up being a Jane and always sweeping in front of you. Right. Yeah. So, But even uh, Janes would have doctors, right? Uh, I mean, maybe there's a consent factor involved, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but, like, punctuality could be another virtue, too. And I think it's harder to poke a hole in that one. I mean, maybe rigidly showing up at 7 on the dot if the party starts at 7 might annoy the host, whereas showing up 5 minutes, you know, an hour early is inappropriate and showing up an hour late is inappropriate. But something in the middle. Well, the, the, it would only annoy the host if it is understood that the cultural norm is for everyone to show up a half hour late. Yeah, I was. I was really stretching. In which case, that wouldn't be a virtue that you would hold. Yeah, you're right. I was really stretching with with that one. the the theme with, <laughs> The theme with virtues is that it's it's a it's a middle point between two extremes, and the extremes are both vices. And so Aristotle called it the golden mean, or he didn't call it that; he said it in Greek. Um, but that's that's what it's come to been come to be called. Uh, so. You know, like we said, your your 
disposition towards violence might be, you know, when necessary and not never, right? Those those are the, uh, that's kind of the way to put that. But there's going to be a different golden mean depending on the culture. For example, punctuality, the, the, correct, the correct way to be is going to be um, an hour late if you're in Peru. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Peruvians, but I've heard some things. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Whereas, whereas in the U.S. it's to be on on the dot on time or a few minutes early. No, really. Well, for for a meeting, not for a for a party. meeting. Yeah. Okay. And the... Right. So, isn't isn't that relativism? I don't know. Yes. I don't know. If punctuality is. Uh... But that's not relativism. The, you still want to be there at the appropriate time. It's just that the appropriate time is uh, not the time that you are told. Yeah, but the, the appropriate amount of killing people and being violent is different in different cultures. Yeah. And the appropriate amount of, um, I don't know, sexual forwardness, forwardness is different. Yeah. And, like, is, doesn't that make it relativism? Well, so that that's one criticism, and that's, that's partly why, you know, Aristotle isn't setting forward, like, a modern ethical framework. So... I don't know if punctuality is, is broad enough to be uh, a, virtue. a virtue on its own, but it, it kind of is. So, like, we kind of work with it. Um, you know, so as, long, as long as you're working within the, the appropriate you could, you framework of what's expected. You could extend so, it to um, re- reliability. Exactly. In, in which case, it should be flexible, depending on what the, the needs are, right? Yeah. I mean, whoever you're working with. That in general, you want it to be a very strong desire, but if there's other things that outweigh it, then it gets outweighed. Yeah, you won't let my, like, I won't let my obligation to return the $20 that you let me, let my family starve, right? Right. I will, I'll renege on that for the time being. Um, so that's partly what makes virtue ethics uh, not desirable to some people and super desirable to others is that it's super flexible. And uh, it, it is the it is the kind of, of approach that you can work with that lets you uh, adjust culturally, right? I'm trying to think of another example. I guess, you know... It's also the approach that I hope leads to less paper clipping of the universe. <laughs> Can you expand on that? Well, uh, when you have only one desire to make as many paper clips as possible, then you paper clip the universe. But when you have multiple competing virtues and desires, then sometimes uh, some of them will outweigh the making of one more paper clip. When your need is to be completely honest, then you might have a uh, undesirable outcome, right? Right. So... It's kind of becoming apparent that that is both a strength and a weakness of, of the virtue approach. Like, it, it seems, you know, if you have two competing values, how do you decide which virtue to go with? Uh, you know, um, do you let well, your... It, generally, you go with the virtue that is... Not generally. You always go with the virtue that is stronger due to your programming. The, the question for the, the ethicist is, what is the appropriate level of strength we want for each desire? Oh, when building an AI or something. I meant for, like, Or, or when building or a human. human. Uh... If you're building your own moral ethics, how do you, where do you go? Yeah. How think, do you live your life? How do you be a good person? Oh yeah, that so that that gets around to the other big Greek word that Aristotle threw around a lot, which was eudaimonia. And correct my Greek if I'm wrong on the pronunciation. That's the, that's the good life, uh, that this is more about. And it wasn't so much of a moral connotation like it would be if we're talking about stuff today, right? It was more about how. How do you, it's the kind, it's hard to, there's not, it, you use the Greek word because there's not a good English word for it. Um, you could say flourishing, but that sounds kind of like plants, but it's more akin to like developing really well into the best that you can be. Uh, a good paraphrase might be the kind of life that if you could choose, you would choose for yourself and for those you love. You know, it doesn't have specifics to it, um, although there are prerequisites to it, but it's more just, you know, you want them to be as as best as they can be. The downside of that is that there are some prerequisites, like you Aristotle argued, and I think he's mostly right, that you can't have the great life that you'd wish for everybody that you love and for yourself if you're born, you know, without a good physical body, if you're born super poor, if you're born ugly and people hate you. Uh, there, so there, there, are, there are factors outside of your control that come in to having a, a Udaman life. But he, he acknowledges that too. I think I wanted to just finish up on the virtue thing, though, that I think that it's, it's, a, it's a strength of virtue theory if the approach that you're looking for is something that is flexible for wherever you're at. Um, so Kant would hate it. Uh, the consequentialist would kind of say you're doing it wrong, but whatever. Um, 
you know, you're not even, you're, he was saying not even, you're not even doing it. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're not, that's not, a, that's not a moral theory. Um, but it is but, based on, it, it's in a way, when you said it all comes back to consequentialism, it is based on the fact that this, at least in my opinion, it tends to have the best consequences rather than trying to sit down and figure out the individual, all utilons that will happen from this action and all the possible knock-on effects. For sure. That having the the experimental laboratory of the entire society, we tend to have uh, found some virtues that work pretty well. Yeah, I think, and I'm, I'm not... <laughs> so like, say you right after our election talk. So, yeah. I, damn I'm, it. Proved wrong by reality <laughs> again! <laughs> I'm not a super gung-ho consequentialist, but I think that that general approach is right. Like when someone when someone asks if if you should uh, murder a toddler, virtue ethicists would say no, but a consequentialist would say, well, if that toddler is Hitler, then yes. The consequentialist would acknowledge that in the real world, you don't know if that toddler is going to grow up to be Hitler. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that that you know, if we're going to be charitable to the moral realists or the moral relativists, let's be charitable to the consequentialists too. Fair, we all agree. And but that, that's the thing too is check all of these would say killing the kid is wrong, right? So. 75 to 90 percent of the time your moral compass is going to point in the same direction no matter what your subscription is yeah. uh you know generally don't lie generally don't steal generally don't kill people if you're a deontologist it's never but you know most of the time you're not gonna do those things anyway um actually i was reminded of something that jesse brought up at our lesson at our last meeting which is the idea of having a panel in your head um that he got from elsewhere but we'll, we'll see if we can find the original person who talked about this you have a panel in your head and it's made up of people with different moral theories and how do you um how, how do you invite those people to your panel in what proportion you might have um you know two seats for deontologists you might have um seven set aside for consequentialists and you might have five for the virtue ethicists and you never invite the moral relativist <laughs> <laughs> who, who knows i don't know um <laughs> But certainly stay away from those fucking divine command guys. Right. Where where what you're what you're kind of doing is you're blending some of those theories um, in terms of how to apply it to your own life. Yeah, because for sure. you can't if you're a consequentialist, you really can't predict a lot of the consequences to what you're doing. So you might want to take a shortcut through another moral theory. And so there are different flavors of consequentialism. One of them is uh, like rule or excuse me of utilitarianism there's rule utilitarianism mm-hmm. where you kind of set up kind of like it's it's de- basically deontology but you acknowledge that you're doing it for the generally good consequences not for the good in its own action mm-hmm. you know so like you're not going to lie because you know other than like unless you have time to reconsider that but generally you'll make a policy of not lying because uh that tends to be good so like Jesse's approach with the with the with the mind panel i know he had a word for it and i can't remember what it was that only works if you have the time to sit and deliberate but you know like aristotle acknowledges and, and kant acknowledges and the consequentialist acknowledges everyone who you take everyone who gives it actual thought says, yeah, you don't have the time to think through every decision you're going to make. Some things just come right up, you know. So you 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 know you either have quick heuristics that you use to come to the right at the right action, or uh, you try and think through as many things you can in advance, or you know you have flexible rules or whatever. I think one thing that people try to poke a hole in, in consequentialism and util- in utilitarianism by doing is saying, well, you can never, you know. You know, you, you know, if the house is on fire, you don't have time to sit down with a pen and paper and figure out who's worth saving. But that's not, that is not when the utilitarian is doing their, their, their calculation. They're doing it when they're at home, they've got 10 minutes, and they're saying, well, I've got a $1,000 charity budget this month. What am I going to do with it? Well, I could, you know, I could drive down the street and throw a dollar out my window every, you know, every few seconds. Hmm, what are my other options, right? So uh, it's not necessarily about the the knee-jerk reaction that you have in immediate circumstances it's about the reasoned moral action and then you do have time to consider as many external externalities as possible if you're considering that you know if you've already decided it's a charity budget you can decide what the best charity to give it to is you can give it to extremely rare puppy disease you can give it to an individual homeless person you can give it to give well you can give it to the against malaria foundation and you'll think about if you have the time and the, the resources, you'll give as much research as you can into any of your options that are worth considering and go with the one that you decide is best. So based on how much you've been talking about this just now, do you think where people put their charity dollars is the most important moral consideration most people will have? Mm, not most people, but 
like if you most have a, people don't have the money it, exactly. for it to be the most important uh, consideration that they have. Yeah, exactly. If you do have a substantial charity budget, um, I think everybody, except for maybe Kant, would agree that it's worth considering where that money is actually going. So I don't know if that's the, the biggest moral concern that a person would have, but it's the kind of thing that they, they, they can give a lot of forethought to. Mm-hmm. And that there are, um, if you grant the premise that making the world a better place is a good thing, so, you know, like, I find the arguments that, like I said earlier, attack the first premise to be pretty uninteresting. You know, if, you, if you're going to sit there and question every term in their first, in their opening sentence, you're not really getting anywhere. Well, I've, um, I, I, okay, so every, everyone who thinks about ethics always says, I want to make the world better. That's, that's what people in general want. That's but there what... are some people who say that the world is made better if women stay covered up in burqas and can't drive right so that kind of comes so, down to yeah you why what why is your your how do you, how is your vision of the world different from theirs why why is your better better than their better yeah, that's that's a good relativist question <laughs> so um i would first say that, that 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 isn't everyone's concern that you know makes the world better if you're a deontologist maybe if you're a virtual ethicist or if you're an egoist that's not really what you're caring about you're caring about what's good for you and you know what's good for you it's what makes you happy the, the utilitarian would extend that in saying, well, people, they seek happiness. If they're stopped from it, that's bad. Presumably being forced to live in a cloth bag when it's 120 degrees out in the desert makes you unhappy. Presumably being shot in the face for trying to learn to read, it makes you unhappy. So that but, but by... the consequentialist would say, uh, if you have to shoot uh, someone in the head in order to prevent all of society from disintegrating and us reverting to the level of barbarism that you see in... Uh, the movies. It, yeah. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yes. Let's say we're uh, we're losing half of our children before the age of three to disease, and there's people starving to death at fairly regular basis. And the only way to prevent that is to keep society strong, keep civilization running, and that requires making sure that a certain subset, such as the ones with female genitalia, don't know how to read. That is a worthy sacrifice, right? Yes, but that is not the the world in which it's like that. That changes what we were just talking. About. Mm-hmm. Like so, the, the 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 world in which this is actually happening now isn't that world, right? Right. So, so the problem is they're factually wrong, or they don't even believe what like that long story premise that you laid out, right? I, I, I think, think that a lot of them do. Actually do they think the world that. will fall apart? Yeah, I they, thought that they're it was doing just... it to keep their society strong because if they don't, society collapses. I think I think they're mistaken about what makes a society strong. Well, yeah, I mean, but it's so... possible that people are coming from that angle. My, I my think assumption, we hear some of that from people. Yeah, my assumption is that in general, people do want the world to be good. They just are mistaken on on what makes the world better. Okay, right? I thought you were making a different what, argument. So what like, good is <laughs> right. Well, so I thought you were making a different point. The like the the abhorrent conclusions of some utilitarian calculations. If you haven't played the game The Last of Us, skip the next thirty seconds. It's a long, awesome story of the the main character and the like teenage girl like that he's companion with, he loses sometimes, and they're, they're doing the thing. At the end, she's captured. She has a resistance to the zombie virus. It's a zombie game. Mm-hmm. Um, and doctors are going to... It's gonna, a fungus. Yeah. And she, she has an immunity in her. Mm-hmm. And they're going to... The only way to get it is to cut it out of her brain, and that, that kills the person. So uh, that would be the right thing to do. They can cure the, they can cure the plague by killing her. It would not only so, be the right thing to do, but there's a strong suggestion that that's what she would want to do if she was caught if she knew about it yeah double spoiler alert the protagonist of the game does not agree anyway so i thought that's what you're getting at so with that he, sort of repugnant conclusion yeah takes her away and doesn't tell her about it uh, in order to save her life against her will okay and i totally disagree with his with what he did because that's not a it, I, it's I, not a consequentialist right? or you, it is consequentialist if what you're valuing is that one girl's life, it's egoist in that case. Yeah, I think I think every basically every human would agree with you that that was an immoral act. And yet, I've found so many people who think it's an absolutely moral act, and I think that they're probably virtue ethicists and deontologists. I think they're mostly egoists because in the game he killed a lot of people to get her out of there. Oh, he did. So they're not deontologists, and they're probably not virtue ethicists. How about care? But... We didn't talk that oh, much yeah. about um, care ethics, so I think that that was maybe that was it. Yeah, he cared about her. Absolutely. In fact, she was maybe the only person that he cared about. Ah. So. Everyone else of, didn't matter. That's right. Yeah. So care ethics is smaller utilitarianism, bigger egoism. It's you care about the people in your network, whether that's you know it's as big as you want. It can be me and my two best friends. It can be me and my entire family. Me and my family and all of their friends. That's um, how a lot of crime families work. Yeah. 
Uh, within the family, there is very, very strong moral stuff, but anyone outside the family, they're, you know, they're marks. Yeah. They don't matter. And uh, it's it's essentially, I guess, how utilitarian would act if the people outside of their sphere of concern didn't matter at all. Or not even didn't matter at all, but mattered significantly less. So, like, if they were bacteria or something. Yeah. Or, I mean, maybe that wasn't even quite fair. It would be, you know, like, a utilitarian might care a lot more about people than they care about, uh, you know, cats or dogs. Steven, um, do you think that the protagonist in The Last of Us was right with what he did? No. Uh, Hell no. I don't, I definitely don't think so, but I, th- I think I'm on a YouTube video as... <laughs> with somebody who does a great deal of um of video game commentary disagreeing with him about that because hmm. he was like yes is absolutely right how honorable how you know see that that strikes me as some ending. combination of of deontology and command so i think that's this is where people get tripped up on using words like right mm-hmm. uh, that's what. That's why when I'm using outside of this conversation, I I almost never use the words ethics, morals, or not even right and wrong, unless right and wrong are pre-established to mean making the world a better place, and that kind of means exactly what your intuition think like, what what your intuition says it means, uh, where people are more free to meet their to to do what they want, enjoy themselves, uh, achieve their goals, whatever it is, right? The girl was his daughter, right? No, what? just some girl. But no. the girl was not his daughter? Oh, no. No oh. relation. I always thought it was his daughter. Nope. Okay. I right. think it's care ethics. It's care yeah, ethics. It, it, it's care yeah. ethics, and I think it's also... I think also... that there's, there's a certain extent that he was willing to go to and um, to cure the world of, of this horrible zombie fungus, and um, losing this person that he cared about was not within that. Yeah, so he has a bad utilitarian, but possibly good care ethicist. Bad yeah, utilitarian. It, bad. It, yeah. I mean, you know, even, even people who don't like utilitarians would say, you know, look, uh, if you could do this one thing that even ruins your life and kills somebody and it saves the world, you, you should do it. Everyone everyone says that. There's probably um, people that try to argue you on slippery slope grounds and be like, well, then why do you draw the line between that and killing a healthy people and person and taking their organs to cure five sick people? Right. I think you draw the line, I mean, at least in this case, you draw the line at being one person this one time to save everybody. Whereas like if we lived in the world, so that, that the one, another, uh, Enosh alluded to another common thought experiment against consequentialism. Baby Teresa. What's Baby that? Teresa. Oh, it was the first, it was the first chapter in the book you lent me today, Stephen. Oh, I haven't read it in Baby Teresa was, um, an acephalitic baby. So, um, or anceph. Oh no, the wines are happening again. You. It's she, either anencephaly no, 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 no. No, no, or no, no. acephaly, but the point is that the baby's born without the majority of their brain. Oh, sure. So they're born with a brain stem. They're able to breathe and do um, impulsive reactions, but there's there's no thought there mm. um, because because most of the brain and the top of the head is the top of the skull is also missing. Right. So the question: the parents wanted their baby, their baby whose name was Teresa. Her organs to be harvested to save the lives of other babies. Yes. And thus started the massive ethical conundrum that made it into this philosophy book. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> and that that's a that's a different case uh, than than the general main main criticism I was going to bring up. But that is important, and that that raises the question of like, what do we have an ethical obligation towards? Like, you would think any parent that would do that with their healthy baby would be a monster. Well, there's five other people here with sick babies. I'll let them go ahead and just cut mine up and give them their organs. That's that's all kinds of screwed up. But we don't have... I think the parents and the doctors involved understood that at some level, we don't have an ethical obligation towards this human. It doesn't have anything that it's like to... It doesn't have any doesn't consciousness. Have it doesn't have a personhood. Um, so the, the, the standard conundrum goes, you're visiting the doctor. You're perfectly healthy. It's you, Katrina. And... Uh, you're visiting at the hospital for some reason because that's important for the thought experiment because it happens to be that there are five dying patients and they all need a different organ and they're all your blood type. And your doctor's like, well, one for five. This is, you know, I, I would, I would try to switch on the trolley problem. I'm going to go ahead and do this. There's an obvious answer to that. If um, all of those sick patients are going to die, then sacrifice. One of them should either, they should draw straws or one should volunteer to be sacrificed for the others since they're all obviously the same blood type too, if they're the same blood type as I am. 
and that way, and they all have different organs that are failing and other healthy organs. Yeah. One of them should die. I don't have to even be involved in that situation. I stay healthy. That right. is that is the most practical answer I have ever heard to that. But that was awesome. You just came up with that right now on the fly. That's actually Tim's answer. Oh, okay. So, and that, that that's a good answer. But like to make yeah. to make the thought experiment do its legwork, imagine the least convenient possible world, right? Say so they're all dying of some mysterious bone marrow thing, and you have the same. You have a matching bone marrow type, and they need all of your marrow. It'll kill you to give it up, but it'll be enough to save all of them. But, but they, they can't donate to each other because they're all sick. Okay, that's so. always the case, right? So I could give all my bone marrow. Well, bone marrow you make more of. They need so all of I it could... right now. You're going to get sick and die. The point, the, the idea... It's I a, know, it's, it's I a... know. I mean, there's <laughs> such a temptation to try to duck out of these when there's an obvious solution. Right. Um, <laughs> I think the standard reply is that uh, it has more negative consequences because then people simply stop going to doctors because they're scared they will be harvested and killed. And so the whole world in general is worse off since no one ever gets any medical treatment at all. Exactly. So there, that, that's, that's where I was going to try and go, is the standard route. But I do like your way of destroying it because it a, it's, a, it's a... That was baller. It was baller as hell. Um, like Tim. Okay. Cred- credit to Tim. Um, if you see him again before we see him, which is probably going to happen, let him know that we think he's awesome. Okay. So... The, the main critique of, of consequentialism that you kept bringing up is that you can't predict all the consequences. And yet, in this thought experiment, they stop at, like, you know, two days later. Not a month later when it turns out that people are freaking out that this can happen. Mm-hmm. Um, so part of it is considering the long-term consequences in as, in as much detail as you can. Um, or as reliably as you can. I, I was just so, saying, like, So the consequences, it's, um, it, it's kind of, it reminds me of um, economics and economists trying to pitch important um, tax policy changes to a focus group. I guess this is a planet money thing recently. I didn't see it, but I heard about it secondhand. I've probably heard about it because I've heard every episode of Planet Money. Okay. Except for the Truffles one that just aired recently. All right. So did you know, I think it's Planet Money, and it might be something else with money in the title that is also a popular podcast, but I think it's Planet Money. Um, Anyway, they had economists from all over the board. Um, all over the the right wing, left wing, in the middle, talk about different policies that they thought everybody would agree on. Mm-hmm. I know which one. All economists would agree on, and they came up with six. Mm-hmm. And but they talked about why also it would not be, it never be proposed by a politician because reasons why all of them would be very unpopular. Then uh, the next phase of that was to try to pitch it to a focus group, and I think what and Tim was the person who told me about this. And he said that the frustrating part was that the people in the focus group could only think of the first step. They really had trouble um, conceptualizing of any further implications. So they could only think of the first part. So take away uh, mortgage interest deductions, right? But, But then we won't have those deductions. But then the cost of owning a home will go up and... That's it. That's that's it. That's as far as they could go conceptually. Um, these these lay people in the focus group. Mm-hmm. Anyway, I was thinking about that. Um, a lot of times when we're doing our consequentialism, as as lay people, we can only think of one or two steps out, right? Is that what you're? Yeah, exactly. And I, that's a really good example. And I like the. Uh... The, the sad reminder that the lay people aren't the best at thinking long-term prediction-wise or long-term consequence-wise. Um, and that, that derailed me a little. Where were we? <laughs> so, As was so pointed we out talking... on Tuesday, yes, we know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yes. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, this is true. And that's why it turns out that voting's a problem. <laughs> but <laughs> Which we have an episode about. That's right, that Tim was also on. Yeah. Uh, not that he's on this one, but his voice that I'm remembering is on it. Uh, he's on this were, one in spirit. In spirit. Uh, what you were talking about, Stephen, is you know the people harvesting the bone marrow or organs or whatever. Oh, yeah. um, they're they're thinking it's hard to think beyond the first step of there are five people who will survive if they have this compared to the one person, the one healthy person. Right. It's not a standard trolley problem because there are there are other things to consider outside of that. Absolutely. Um, Someone might consider, like, well, what if it was done in secret just once? Um, so this, 
I don't know what Peter Singer would say, who might be a you know dedicated utilitarian. I would still say that you're doing something wrong by, you know, hurting that one person. Um, you know, maybe give them the option to donate. What you know, if, if they if someone needs a kidney, well, I've got two. You know, See, the, um, the the the. What, why can't you do it just in secret one time so it won't ever have any effects except for saving, you know, four extra lives? Right. Is uh, one of the reasons that, again, I'm going to beat my personal hobby horse since I like virtue ethics, is one of the ways that I think virtue ethics uh, has a leg up here because virtue ethics says that a person who has the virtue of, of not uh, falling into the trap of killing people to save five and making the entire world worse is someone who, even when he was given the option to do it one time in secret to save five people, still wouldn't do it because that uh, that revulsion in him of doing the, such a thing would prevent him from doing it. So the the one case that we want to avoid is avoided because of his general desire to... Right. But while we expect doctors to not make that choice, to follow the Hippocratic Oath... Yeah. Right. And we expect that of doctors, but there are plenty of people in the world who we expect to make the choice of killing people to save others, mm -hmm. to save more people, potentially. So rarely works out that way. Um, and, and that's totally acceptable to us. And that's within the ethical schema is to have soldiers go out and and be honored for killing in order to save others. Mm -hmm. Right. Or to save other interests or, you know, for whatever reason. It's I, I guess it is assumed by people that someone made the calculation somewhere and said that the best way to preserve social stability or our national interest or whatever it is, is that we have to sacrifice X thousands of people in war. And that is better than the alternative consequence. So we expect some people to use X ethical system in our culture. And we expect other people to use Y ethical system in our culture, depending on their profession. Um, I'm not sure about that. Like we expect soldiers to benefit to like the command on high. Yes, but I think and that you want the, you want the commanders to kind of be utilitarian. So and the commanders to be utilitarian, right. and we want our doctors to be deontologists. Well, our doctors, we also want to be utilitarian. We've just made the decision that the best utilitarian option is for them not to sacrifice the healthy person because then the knock-on effects mean everyone is worse off. Friendly reminder that there is a popular version of utilitarianism called rule utilitarianism. Yes. That would, that would <laughs> let the is doctor that what be, driving a, towards? be a consequentialist and, and not do this. But the deontologist would also say absolutely not. Mm -hmm. um, the, it, it, the works, other, it works in both. There's yeah. a lot of overlap. So the, and the, that, that's kind of one of the themes of moral philosophy, right? That they tend to go the same way. Like, so the deontologist, we mentioned the, the categorical imperative. The other, um, so there are two formulations of it, and it's supposed to be the same general principle and these two derivations. The other one is that you never treat people as a means to an end. They're always means in themselves, people being rational agents. Um, if, if you're going to sacrifice somebody as an, as an organ farm, you're using that person for, for other ends, not for ends that they, as their own ends, right? What if you're using someone to help harvest your crops? Uh, so that, that's kind of one of the problems, again, deontology is kind of easy to poke into, right? So like, you know, your barista at Starbucks, you're using as a coffee delivery machine, right? Um, you might ask their name and talk to them, but for the most part, you know, can I get coffee? Thanks. Bye. Um, it, they're, they're, they're just coffee pots that you have to talk your order into, right? So, wow. uh, if, if you're, if you're not caffeinated, if you're not caffeinated in the morning, that's how you feel. Um, yeah, but you know, you, you. It, it's okay, and the society recognizes that. Like, you know, you're not talking to them as ends in themselves while they're there doing their job. And well, just like you would... society does. In a much smaller, more close-knit society, that would be considered extremely rude if you don't stop by and talk, talk with Joe for five minutes when you get your coffee from him. Sure. Uh, I also wouldn't expect, you know, they're, they're seeing me as, you know, a means to bring business to the company. They don't care what I'm doing there. They're they transaction. Just, they there are transactionary relationships, right. right? And then there are other kinds of relationships. Anyway, there was one last point I wanted to make on moral philosophy, which was I sort of made a case that I feel like under the surface, most of these approaches are consequentialist at, at bottom. Virtue ethicists argue for virtue because it tends to work out well. The deontologist, the, the maxims argued there, argued for there are argued for because they tend to work out well. Um, if, the, if the maxim was, it's okay to steal, go forth and do it all the time, that would be chaos. So that, that wouldn't be a maxim that you could universalize. I think 
this is going to be the stretchiest one of these. I think even the relativist could be utilitarian at bottom, or at least could be consequentialist, have a consequentialist consideration, because the problem, if we're to say our society is better than theirs, well, then we can do what we want to impose our will on them, and that might involve killing a bunch of people, and that's bad. So we shouldn't, so let's just stop it at the bottom and say we can't say we're better. That might be where that is kind of going. That was got some pretty decent steel mining there. Well, I'm, I'm also saying that they're being inconsistent. That they're being consequentialist and they're not being relativist. Right. So, but, but, I mean, that's some good, decent steel mining. We will argue that uh, their ethics are just as good as ours so that we do not have to have this war where we kill a lot of them in order to impose our morality. I think that's sort of like the... We're the si- yeah, I we're saying we, we want everyone to get along, yeah. right? Yeah, I think that's the fear that underlies most of moral relativistic thinking, that uh, especially, you know, like, after a couple of bad centuries of, of imperialism by Europeans and stuff, it's like, okay, you know what? We can't just, we can't say they're savages and bad anymore. Whereas uh, I would, I would argue that you can say that they are bad, but you don't necessarily have to go and impose your will on them. You can use a softer form of power. It's, it's interesting, right? So I think, <clears throat> I think like Steve, providing birth control. Yeah. Stephen Pinker, I think it was Stephen Pinker, gave the analogy that if you learned that one person held down a screaming five-year-old girl and cut her labia off with a with a sharpened stone oh god i don't want this and, to be in the episode <laughs> all right well let me let me rephrase that if you learned that your neighbor or if you learned that one person held down a five-year-old and performed the procedures involved in female genital mutilation oh god collo- there you go. colloquially we can't use that word sure we can it's the reality right, yeah. we, we can if, if you're squeamish about it we can say it's a real female thing. circumcision it is a real thing it's a real thing yeah, yeah, it's, a, it's, a it's a horrible thing about, it's, a, it's yeah. a horrible thing about facing so if you learned that one person did that the only question to ask would be you know would life in prison be a severe enough punishment for him mm-hmm. if, if so then if you learn that a million people are doing it then then it thereby becomes culture and is magically above criticism I don't I think it's don't above know. criticism at all. I don't but, think no, that's but the, what's but, but the relativist the does. I don't think that's what's happening in that situation either for why we why we feel that way about your neighbor doing it versus a culture doing it. Doesn't it doesn't have to be your neighbor. It can be somebody in another culture. But if it was just one person, then it's, it's, it's terrible. If it's a lot of people, it's somehow If okay. it's one person, it's easy to dissuade that yeah. by taking... by Throwing them in prison. Well, that's one way is to take them out of the culture. The other way is to make sure they can't do it again in some other way. But Cut off their hands. That's oh, what I was like. Gosh. <laughs> um, We're talking about the gravity of what they did. But yeah. And, and you know, punishments that are uh, not atypical in cultures where that practice is also involved. We're right? having maybe, emotional reactions right now. Maybe yeah. I'm And the emotional little, reaction is appropriate with something that terrible. Anyway. Maybe I'm strange in that I think that if somebody does something horrible, that... The most important thing is making sure that they don't do that again. I don't and think you're strange. I think you're just a better person than I am. Instead of, and I don't actually really think that people should be punished if it can be avoided. I, I yeah, no, I totally agree, and that's where I'm at. All, that's where I, I think a few weeks ago I made an argument that said I wouldn't kill Uday Hussein uh, if there was another way to detain him. Right. Right. So yeah, the, the important thing is to stop them from doing bad things. Or, and the, the consequentialist is famously against the death penalty. Or reform him. Right. If and possible. Then he can go out into the world and do good, right? And yeah. be, be a good person. And maybe person. feel so bad that he spends the rest of his life atoning and making life that's, better. That's, I mean, that's the punishment part, is that he f- you want him to feel terrible. Like, what oh. if he changes his life and then he can feel good about himself because he is actually making people's lives better? No, I totally agree. The isn't, primary... that, isn't that the nicer thing? That is the nicer thing. I, isn't that better, I do though? not have... I cannot, in my brain, model someone who is a good person, who knows that he did that in the past, that wouldn't want to atone for it for a long time. Well, if he didn't try sure. to atone for atoning, it, I wouldn't come... Atoning is different than, like, hating yourself. Yes. Right? Did I use the term hating myself? You said he's going to feel so terrible about it for the rest of his life, and that's... <laughs> I guess I did say that, didn't I? <laughs> I? I meant he would have a strong uh, desire to atone for his yeah. past actions. Yes, as as one should. Yeah. Where were we? Oh, yeah, so uh, I was going <clears> to <throat> say the difference between the one person doing it and the culture is you have to take a different approach to the culture mm-hmm. because, you know, like, th- throwing people, throwing everybody in... Well, I mean, I guess that probably would help, but... Um, but, but it, you can't. It takes a lot of resources in yeah. order to, yeah, uh, uh, assault a million people and throw them in jail, and they're going to resist. And also, that would be incredibly disruptive to right. their entire 
society so to that, have most of the people thrown in jail at that point. I'm just, it, it, it seems to me the person who says, and therefore it's their culture and it's okay, is someone who is blinding themselves intentionally. Instead of saying, this is terrible, but we're not going to do anything about it because the costs are so great, we can't. They, they say, oh, but it's okay. And I, I dislike that sort of blinding themselves. Yeah, I think that 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 it is the blinding oneself to that consequence that the relativist is doing. They're not they're not saying it's is wrong and I wish we could do something about it, but they're saying if I could press a button that stops them from doing that, I wouldn't because of their culture. You know, and that that's the that's the weird thing that like philosophy in general kind of has this problem, but especially ethics like we're just talking about like the average person on the street. Um everyone's a moral philosopher, right? Mm-hmm. Um but well, that I said that as a joke, and it's kind of my point that people people seem to think that in some weird way that like Peter Singer's opinion on what's the right thing to do is worth just as much as you know Al Baghdadi's opinion on what what the right thing to do is, and or they, what their opinion on the right thing to do is right in a way that like we don't do with any other domain, right? Uh, my opinion on physics is worth less than Stephen Hawking's. And no one would be tempted to say that. Well, no, we should we should hear Zuber out. Maybe he's got something to this. No, he he doesn't not he doesn't hold a candle to people actually know what they're talking about. I think people well, have we're this thing. We talking about that with Kant though, where where I was like, but this seems ridiculous. This seems like this can't be what his actual position is. And then um, I think he said something like. Yeah, well, I mean, neither of us are famous philosophers, and Kant is, so... And I said that tongue-in-cheek. <laughs> I, I, yeah, no, I absolutely didn't mean, and therefore we should take him seriously. Um, but... I, I meant that as a point that philosophy has a bad time pushing out stupid ideas. So, yeah, no, I, 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 when I said that, if you took me seriously, I didn't... I meant that as a complete joke. Yeah, we're not famous philosophers. That actually so... sounds like a somewhat serious argument, though. Kant was smart in a lot of other areas. So that, that I think, is the main reason that he's popular was popular and still is and universal I, that universe universalizability is that the word mm-hmm. yeah it is actually a pretty important concept actually, i don't think that was his word i think that came around a few decades ago but the same idea mm-hmm. um is somebody yeah. trying to interpret his wording it, it's it's desirable but it, it it's not the kind of thing that like actually works we think about it for five minutes mm-hmm. and there, there are there are other versions of the ontology i know less about the ontology than i do about consequentialism and utilitarianism and virtue ethics Mainly because it seemed on its face so ridiculous that I didn't spend that much time doing it, and, and the primary maybe maybe you should. Well, the pri- the other reason is the the primary source on it, Kant is uh, notoriously hard to read in a way that seems like he was going out of his way to be di- like confusing. Well, I think we learned a lot. One yes. of the things that one of the things that we learned is that I will no longer call myself a moral relativist, and that apparently. Um, morals and ethics only apply to rational actors and I didn't realize that before and that the kind of rationality that um, animals have is different. I think that it that it applies in the extent that you could blame somebody for doing something wrong. Okay. So like and you wouldn't blame a lion for doing something wrong. No. You might you might analyze it and be like man it really should have eaten that that pregnant gazelle because it was full of you know extra food. Um, <laughs> and easier to catch. Exactly. So uh, and you might say it was wrong to do that because it's, you know, lowering the chances to getting food next year, but, like, it doesn't know. It's just doing what lions do. Um, so that, I think, is why the, the capacity for reason is stressed so much in that field. The last thing I was going to say is speaking of, like, rehabilitating people as far as whether they're doing something wrong. That is the only, I think, sane way to deal with transgressors is to rehabilitate. You can, there are, like, four ways that you can, there are four theories behind punishing people for doing something wrong. You know, one is retribution, you know, eye for an eye. You hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back just because that makes it fair. And I forget the other two. And one, the other one is rehabilitation. You hurt me, I'm going to try and make it so that you don't do that again. To well, other at least people. one of those other two is deterrence, right? I'm yes, going to hurt you so other people will see that this is what happens when you do this sort of thing. Right, deterrence and then uh, remove you from society okay. because mm-hmm. you're a threat and a danger. So, um, so we which... have re- removal, deterrence... Rehabilitation and retribution. Retribution. Yeah. See, retribution is the only one that I really have a problem with. I think there's a lot to be said for deterrence, and there, there are people that need to be removed. Yeah. So, like you said, like you know, some people feel bad about what they did and come to terms with it. Some people lack that nugget that lets them have compassion. Uh, there are broken people out there. Now, if you, if we could fix that, that'd be great. But since we can't, we're gonna just keep you over here behind these walls where you can't hurt regular people. Um, like that's unfortunately the best we can do. You know, being, we'll, we'll try not to torture you while you're in there, but 
being yeah. a bit of a biorelativist, no, not biorelativist, biodeterminist myself, there's something to be said for uh, at some parts in people's lives, they're just much more violent. And if those people, you can remove them for the decade or two that they are violent, afterwards when they come out, they aren't as bad. You mean like boarding schools for teenagers with, you know, thick walls and locking doors? <laughs> <laughs> something like that. For, for people who have violent inclinations, and I've met one or two, there's uh, actually, for some of them, uh, going into um, military is, is actually not a bad career choice because that's the, where they can get out their aggression. Yeah. When I was a probably in middle school. So when I was a preteen, I was going through all of those different hormonal changes. And I remember having, being really disturbed because I had violent ideation. Mm. So I would be walking down the hall and I'd think, I just want to punch somebody. Mm. And I'd think, oh, what a horrible thing to think. I'm a monster. And those thoughts went away. Uh, <laughs> And I was just thinking about how, how you would talk to a young person or a kid and that just be like, so... hey, so... let's talk about ways to deal with these feelings for now in ways that don't involve actually being violent and then kind of let them know that they'll probably pass. How strong was your urge to actually do the violence? I never hit anybody. Yeah. But um, I was, you know, Cause... mostly it turned into self... Uh, just really low self-esteem and like self-hatred because i had a lot of uh violent visualization when i was a kid like just like uh, it'd be cool to mow down everyone in this hallway think of all the bullets flying in the blood and everything you know but it was never a thing that i would act on and i never felt bad about it because i was just like that's what guys do right we like action movies this would be really cool looking it's not like i was actually gonna kill anyone and were you like ever you never thought you were going to. No. So no. did you just... I, I don't know. It, it, and now I wonder if that's like a, a gender some, thing. I had some deep, like, feeling. Yeah. Like I had... <clears throat> I wanted to punch somebody. Mm -hmm. And I, I never did it. And I, you know, I didn't even swear at a person um, until I was in eighth grade once. But, yeah. I think boys might be taught to embrace their violent sides more. It's possible. I think I, I was also con I was in my head conflating uh, ideate or idea ideation. Ideate uh, people say it in different ways, yeah. And visualization, and you guys talked about two different things. Too. I think they are so. You, uh, so I mean, um, I also had plenty of visualization. Um, I read a lot of fantasy books, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I would you know imagine different things that were happening in those fantasy books and. Um, if people were mean to me, I would imagine, you know, like the, the ceiling falling in or whatever, but the desire, the strange desire to, to hurt somebody, um, that came from a different place. Okay. And. Well, did you feel like it was deserved though? Like someone had done something bad? No, it wasn't oh, even no? for a person. It wasn't oh. even for a specific person. It was a, I want to punch someone. Oh, okay. I must have had a different thing than you then. It was just like, um, it was just basic directionless, violent feelings. So I think, I think the takeaway is that. I think that does happen quite a bit in, in teenagehood though, though. I think it does. I, I like to think I'm a very peaceful person. <laughs> and I like to think that I'm not the only person that that happened to. No, I think you're you're pretty super peaceful, and if it happens to you, it happens to everybody. I'm trying to think of exactly specific times. My memory sucks. Um, yeah, you know, where maybe an example, you know, someone pisses you off in traffic, or maybe not, like, is it have to be directioned, or is it just like in general, like, I would just love, like, just to just plow through all these cars with my car right now? Like, that kind of random thought? My experience was directionless. Yeah. If it was a specific person, then it is a whole different situation. So it was just like a flash of rage and desire for violence. Yeah, but it happened regularly for a short period of time. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking if I were in a, maybe if I were in a different situation, maybe if I didn't have um, all of these other reasons to, to not be violent, maybe if it was even encouraged, then things might have turned out a little bit differently. Mm. And good training and impulse control, I assume. I had decent impulse control. I've never had good impulse control. Who am I kidding? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, um, so, yeah, we made our... At this point, we've already made our conclusions. Yeah. We got a little derailed, and then I'm not sure if this is going to seamlessly transition or not, but here we are. We've wrapped up. Uh, 
we didn't have any really listener feedback that we had stuff to comment on, so yeah. um, no listener feedback section on this episode. You can and... never tell how long our listener feedback sections are going to be. <laughs> That's right. So, anyway, this was a little different. It was less of a talking about, you know, a thing and from a rational perspective and kind of just laying out stuff. But I wanted to try and apply some reductionist thinking to what can we take apart from all of these in a way that is actually useful. Maybe we'll attack a different philosophical problem another time. See if we can get to the bottom of free will or... Oh, God, no. Something. Come on, that's easy. <laughs> um, all right. So, anyway, thanks for listening. Signing out. Thanks for listening. Yeah, come back in a couple weeks. And uh, that's that. Bye. Bye.